the uh, yeah. open your Bibles to the book of Romans. Romans. We're going to uh, spend the next several uh, weeks. We won't start. We won't be here week today, but we'll be here next week. But uh, we're going to spend the next several weeks uh, going through the book of Romans and see how that applies uh, to to our lives and what we can do with what Paul tells us uh, as he writes out this. Uh, this, this letter to the Romans. Uh, Paul, the apostle, is the author. It says that in the, uh, the first the first word is Paul. Uh, it's probably written around 55 to 58 AD. It was written to all that be in Rome, uh, beloved of God, called to be saints. Uh, several man, manuscripts of other things were probably delivered by Phoebe. Uh, he sent the letter through her to the Romans. Uh, this morning when I got up, I turned on the news and they were making a saint uh, canonizing uh, Mother Teresa. Uh, if you know Jesus Christ today as your Savior, you're already a saint. You don't have to be canonized. That's the good news. A lot of us don't really understand that, I suppose. But we are saints set apart for God. Uh, Paul wanted to, some of the reasons that he wrote uh, this letter was that he wished to evangelize Spain, and one of the, he needed a local church to be able to push off into the into into Spain. Uh, he had a personal compulsion to visit and witness in Rome itself. He wanted to meet uh, the the church members of, the, of Rome, but he also wanted to uh, evangelize in the city of Rome. Uh, so it was a greatly traveled uh, route. It was a place where there was lots of population, where people moved uh, through Rome, and then they would go back out to their communities. Uh, Orlando is a place that would be a tremendous opportunity to minister. Paul would love that because so many people from so many nationalities, from so many parts of the world, come and go through that city. A tremendous opportunity he would see. Uh, and Paul knew it. Uh, was not sure he could reach every uh, ever eat, reach Rome personally. He didn't know if he was going to be able to get to Rome, and so he wanted to send this letter ahead to encourage uh, to encourage the, the people that were there that were members of the church. The church at Rome was a strong church. Uh, it was a church that was run by the lay lay people. It was a church that probably many people may have been at Pentecost or when the yeah, Pentecost and then had gone back and began to. Uh, began to pro promote the gospel. Uh, Rome had a worldwide reputation. It was a place where uh, people came and went, and it was a tremendous opportunity. Uh, Rome was a Gentile church. It was not Jews. There may have been some Jews in the church, but primarily it was Gentiles. And uh, it was a persecuted church as well. The church of, that was in Rome was being persecuted. Uh, but it was also a triumphant church. Even in the midst of persecution, it had raised up. And, and uh, this is, Romans is uh, the great epistle of theology, of Paul's theology. It's an amazing thing as we go through. It was written for every man and woman. Uh, it's the, the, the church's last testament, uh, an opportunity for us to be people that move into the world. Uh, Romans is the gospel's main truth, and then also God's worldwide plan for Israel and the Gentiles. It slays it out more clearly than any other book in the scripture. And so when we study this, we're, we're right in the midst of what Paul was thinking of his theology. What it meant to Paul to be a, a minister, a servant of God and of Jesus Christ. And so as we look at this, and as we see this, how it impacts our lives, is we need to take from it, uh, we need to take from it what we can apply to our lives and began to use that to minister to the world. One of the things that uh, that we that I would encourage you to do uh, is to take some time uh, in the morning or when you do your devotions and begin to read through and think about uh, the Gospel, I mean the Book of Romans. It's a great book. Uh, it's a great uh, encouragement. It also opens up to us why people need to be. Uh, need to know the Lord because it's Paul builds the case that Gentiles need to know the Lord, that Jews, that there's none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned. He builds that whole case, through. and then he says, "Here's what's happened. We're all uh, lost, but 
God, in His gracious uh, and mercy, has provided a way for us to be part of the family of God. And it helps us to understand, as He lays that out, to understand what, what it means to be lost. It doesn't. I mean, I know a lot of good people, and they say, I don't need to have know the Lord, I'm a good person. But there's none of us that are good people. We all have been infected by sin. And one of the interesting things uh, um, we've gone through in our world the last, this whole thing of grace, you know. I was reading a, uh, with a football player that is a black man, and he, he's getting chastised as a Christian, and he said the problem is not, it's not this ism or that ism or the other ism, it's sin. And until we, as believers, understand that sin is the problem, and, and it's not these isms, but it's sin. And when we come to the core and we begin to minister to the core of people's lives, it's, it's that we need to know Jesus because of the fact we're sinners. And that's what Paul's going to lay out for us. He's going to lay it out very uh, methodically. He's going to lay it out in a way that each of us can understand and that I think can help us when we see other people. We don't see them uh, that with the situations they had to see, we see people that need to know Jesus. And when you view people in that light, it makes a whole different perspective. Uh, let's just, I'm just going to do a couple, little bit this morning. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul said, Paul, a bondservant of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we, you and I, have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. We're just going to take a couple of minutes here this morning and talk about, first of all, Paul. Paul, you know the story of Paul. He was a, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was all done killing and having killed the Christians. Uh, and Jesus encountered him on the road to Damascus, and he uh, knocked him down, he blinded him, and he then went, was sent to see a guy, he said he knocked the scales off, and he became uh, a follower of Jesus. And as a result of that, he says that he's Paul, and he says he's a bondservant of Christ Jesus. I want to just take a couple of minutes on bondservant, because in the Greek it's doulos, which is love slave. And, and so what the idea is that when he became a doula, a love slave, a bond servant, he, he sets aside all of his rights and he sets aside his own personal will. He only does what Christ tells him to do and he doesn't argue about it and he doesn't complain about it. He does it. A servant would get up, be the first one up in the household. He would be the one that would care for all, get everything ready. He would care for his master throughout the day. He would be the, he'd prepare dinner. He would be the last one to go to bed at night, making sure that everything, that everything that was needed to be done was done. It was his responsibility to care for the master. What the masters wanted, what his will was, was what the slave, the disciple, does. Um, I thought about that this summer, son. Um, as a disciple of Christ, if we, if, we are, if we are disciples, followers of Christ, we need to be people that are like the bond servant, the doula, the love slave. As we set aside our rights, we set aside our will, and we do the things that God lays before us, and we do it with joy, and we do it without complaining, and we do it because that's what he's called us to do.
When you decide to follow Jesus and you say, I'm going to be a bouncer, there comes with that some struggles. Because we don't want to give up our rights because we are Americans and we got rights. Right? Rights you got. <laughs> We don't want to give up our will because I want to do this and I want to do that. We don't want to have to say, I'm going to follow and say, Lord, I'm going to do what you've called me to do. I'm going to live in a way that you've called me to live. I'm going to reach out to people that you've called me to reach out to. I'm going to, I'm going to live in such a way that in the midst of the world, people will recognize that there's something different. There's something different about my life because my life is in your life. I think there's a song about that someplace probably. But it's so easy to say it. But the truth of the matter is, it is not easy to live it. It's not easy to live it. And so what Paul's saying, he's saying to us, here's who he is, here's who I am. I'm a bond servant. I'm a love slave of Christ Jesus. And the fact that he says, I have been called. Listen, if you know Christ today, if you've made a, if you've made a commitment to Christ, you too are a bond servant, and you have been called, you have been called by Christ Jesus himself. The call isn't from the, from the neighbor saying, hey, come on out, let's go play golf. The call isn't from the, the guy that comes up and says, could you buy this kind of insurance? The call is from Jesus Christ, the sustainer and creator of the universe, on your life. And he says, see, he says, I want to call you to be an apostle, a sent one. One who takes a message out. And, and you're set apart for the gospel of God. We've been set apart as followers of Christ. We've been set apart so that we can proclaim the gospel to the world. And he promises, Paul tells about how he promises it uh, through the scriptures, his prophets and, and, uh, and his holy scriptures. Concerning his son, he told about it. If you go through the Old Testament, you'll see that Jesus is mentioned in all those, or his, his coming. His son, it's concerning his son who was born of the descendant of David, according to the flesh. Jesus is, is not only God, he's also man. Truly God, truly man. He was born in the flesh, and the flesh from the line of David. And so, uh, who declared, verse 4, the son of God with power, by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of Holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Listen, by the power of the resurrection, oftentimes we want to think about, uh, we think about Christmas, which is coming up with the shoebox, and we think about some of the other events, but think about this, the linchpin, the linchpin of our faith is not the birth, but it's not, and it's not even the death, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is an amazing thing. That, that is amazing power that the God of the universe raised his son who was dead, buried, and he raised him after the third day. And people saw him after that for a number of people, 15, 1800 people saw him, the Bible talks about. And, though, uh, and through whom, in verse 5, we, you and I, have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. Whom, among whom you also are the call of Jesus Christ. You know, we, we like to, we, I think oftentimes we believers take our faith sort of semi-serious. If you're called of God, and you've been given a mission, and you're, you're, you're a slip servant of God, God, you do what he calls you to do, you, you, your will is his will, his will is your will, and, and you understand that you are then called you are called uh, of Jesus Christ, that you are called to share the gospel, the love of Christ with others that you encounter. Um, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, and he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace through Christ because he's called us. He's called us He's called us to be people that are followers of Him that minister to a hurting world. It's not easy when you're uh, an old man and you go back to where you grew up and people know you from the past. 
It's not easy when you say to me, you really need to get a new relationship with Jesus. And the, their first response is always, I remember how you were. Well, God bless you, aren't you wonderful? <laughs> and if you go back to where you're from and you tell people that they need to know Jesus, they're going to say the same thing to you. I remember, I remember that time. I remember this. And I remember that. And the good news is that the Lord forgot it. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> we, we have a responsibility as followers of Christ, of doulos, of being people that are under the subjection of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We have a responsibility to tell other people about Him. We need to be that in loving kindness of maybe putting an arm around somebody that you really rather not. Maybe it's something where you serve a drink, as the, get a cup of water. Maybe it's something where you just say hello to somebody. It's amazing sometimes just a hello to people. And, and in the villages and in the places that we live around us, there's so many people that are so lonely that sometimes a hello gets you a whole life story that you didn't want to hear. But they've got it because they don't have anybody to tell. We need to be people. We need to be people that surrender our, our rights and surrender our will to Jesus Christ. And we need to be people that reach out in obedience and love to encourage others to come to know Christ. The hollowness in their heart. The emptiness that fills. What great opportunity there is for you and for me. I'm not suggesting to you that you have to go out and beat people over the head of the Bible. I'm not suggesting you got to do that. But the biggest thing we need to do is say, you know what? What can I do to help you? What could I do to encourage you? What could I do that maybe would make a life a little bit easier for you today? And as we do that, we, we, the love of Christ flows into the love to, the, to people that are hurting, the people that are without hope, and they see hope coming, not in us, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the responsibility that you've placed upon us. And sometimes we just take it so lax the days ago, we don't really, we don't really understand the reality of being called. We don't really understand the reality of being willing to surrender our rights and our will to you. And even when stuff doesn't make sense, we still need to be people that surrender to you. A glorious God who does nothing but, but care for us, nothing but provide for us the, the best of everything. And yet occasionally, and oftentimes as we go through our struggle, the struggles in our life, we know then, most of all, that you're there with us. So we thank you, we praise you. Father, help us to be men and women that are servants, bond servants of Jesus Christ. And we thank you in his name. Amen. It's a custom of our church to do communion on the first Sunday of the month. And uh, so you don't have to be a member of this church to take communion. You just be one who professes Christ as Savior and you're walking to the table. Uh, Jesus was at the Last Supper, he rose and he took the bread and he broke the bread and he said, this represents my body which is broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. One of the amazing things about this is that we do remember what Christ has done for us and that is, he came he lived, he died a cruel death he went into the tomb and he arose and overcame death with life, resurrection power and we were dead Folks, we were dead without hope, and we came to know Christ as our Savior, and he, um, he raised us from the dead. And so as we take this communion, and we take this bread, we remember, we remember what he has done for us. And then he took the cup, and he said, this represents my body, blood, which was shed for you. Take this, and again, for the remission of sin. So as we do this, we take the cup, and we do, uh, we remember that. Again, that Christ died, his blood was shed for the remission of our sins. His blood covers us. When God looks at us, sinners, when he looks at us and we're in, in a relationship with Jesus, he sees Jesus' righteousness. He doesn't see our sin in it because God, Jesus has covered those sins for us. So we, we remember what he's done. And I, I suggest to you too, it is a reminder, it is a reminder that we are carriers of Christ. Even though it represents the body and the blood, you and I are carriers 
And as we go into the world, we have a responsibility to carry Jesus into the world, sharing with others his great love for them as well as us. Come.